I want us to open our Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, please. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And uh, I was asking God for direction and, and uh, God's brought us to this text. I trust that it will be beneficial to us. He certainly knows the need. 2 Timothy is the last book that we have by the Apostle Paul. He is getting ready to leave out. I preach a message sometimes from this book, just entitled it, The, the Word Next, because uh, Paul is getting ready to check out and he's telling Timothy, now Timothy, you're next. You're the next in line. And uh, there's a lot of young folk in here this morning that you're going to be next. And uh, you need to really think about uh, what, uh, what God would have you to do and not wait until you've been assigned next to figure out which way you're going. Figure it out now. Know that you're going to stick with God and stay with God regardless. Stay with this blessed old King James Bible regardless. Stay with the principles of the word of God regardless and God will see you through. And uh, now Paul is getting ready uh, to die. Notice, if you will, in verse number nine of 2 Timothy chapter four, Paul is saying to Timothy, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmata. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Now let me pause and say that Timothy was in Ephesus when Paul was asking him to come shortly. But you see, Timothy couldn't leave the flock in Ephesus until Tychicus got there. We need to use that as a great principle. Don't leave your sheep with just anybody. Verse number 13, the Bible says, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and by that by the Gentiles or that all the Gentiles may hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I leave off reading there and uh, I'm interested in what the Lord did for Paul when he stood with him in verse number 12. He said, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. And we're going to see three things that the Lord did for Paul when he stood with him. And we're going to see three times that the Lord stood with Paul in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, God stood with Paul three different times. And those three times he stood with him, we'll find that Paul says here, he strengthened him to preach. And then he secured him in persecution and settled him concerning 
perseverance. We're going to see those three times that God stood with Paul. Paul is now reminiscing. He's remembering what God did for him in the past. And those three times that he stood with him, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, if you ever face these times, then I want you to know, even though everyone may forsake him, there's a God who will stay with his own. He's saying, as that brother saying a moment ago, you belong, Timothy, no matter how sick you are, no matter how young you are, you belong, and you belong to God. Hallelujah. I want to, and those times that God stood with Paul was in the night season when he couldn't see. He, he didn't know direction. He did not have any idea about what was going on. There was no light on the situation that he was in. He was in the night, but God can see in the dark. Hallelujah. I'm glad there's no night with God. I'm glad that he's the God of the day. And in my night, he's still the God of the day. God never intervened. He never has to deal with the night because he's the God of the day. God began, brought time about uh, whenever he created man when man began time began but one day time is not going to be anymore when we enter into the time zone with God I'm glad hallelujah that our God is a God of the day and in your night time God can still see just like he could and when we can't see God can hallelujah I'm glad we we got a God that's interested in you and I. Well, I see there's a little preach around here. Now, I want you to notice here Paul's last words. He's remembering the times that God stood with him. Now, keep this in mind. He said here in verse 17 that when the Lord stood with him, he strengthened him to preach. Hallelujah. And then he secured him in persecution. He said he delivered me out of the mouth of the lion. And then he settled in, in preservation. He said, if I face this again, he's going to continue to deliver me. And the same God that was Paul's God is my God. God is my God. He, hey, it was a blessed day in my life when I realized that Abraham's God and Isaac's God and Daniel's God God, hey, and Joseph's God, he's my God, he's my God, there's no God like my God, hallelujah, what a God we serve, somebody said, well, I don't know how we're going to get all this done that we're trying to get done, we're not going to do it, God's going to do it, it's just believing him, uh, now, go with me, please. Now, I'm preaching tonight, today on words from God in the nights of your life. Now, notice in Acts chapter 18, please. I'm going to have to stick with this here. I can see that I can run in a million directions here. So, look at this right here. I want you to look at Acts chapter number 18. We find here in verse number nine. The Bible said, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision. Be not afraid, but speak. Remember, he strengthened him to speak to preach when he told him in the night Paul said everybody forsook me but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me to preach this is where he did that but he said but speak and hold not thy peace I want to deal for just a moment on a word from God in the discouraging nights 
of the ministry. <laughs> oh, what, what brought Paul's discouragement here? Why did he need the Lord to give him assurance in the night? Well, I want to say, first of all, because he was discouraged because of the burden of survival. Now, listen, notice, if you will, in verse number three, Acts chapter 18, one and two, we find that Paul comes to Corinth. There he meets Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife. If you will study, you will find them periodically throughout the life of the apostle Paul and of course uh, of the preacher Apollos. You will find that Apollos came and was preaching in the hand of God only, but he was preaching under the influence of John's baptism only. But Aquila and Priscilla, they, they take this great orator aside and said, but listen, Apollos, there is a, such a thing as being filled with the Holy Ghost. And oh, Apollos got it and kept on preaching. Let me say something to you, young folk, young preacher, if there's an old couple that wants to pull you aside and give you a little constructive criticism, don't think that you know more than they do give ear to what they're saying most of the time if God has sent them to you you need to listen to what they have to say now we see here that Paul now has joined up with Aquila and Priscilla verse number 3 said and because he was of the same craft he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers now we see here that the apostle Paul was a preacher he was an apostle he was being used greatly by God no one ever else has been revealed at the great mysteries of the church the great unseen things of God like the apostle Paul nobody has being closer to God than the apostle Paul has when Paul was receiving those unknown and unseen mysteries of God but yet in the midst of all of that Paul now is having to work with his hands let me say something to you friend there may come a time that you will have to do other than what God has called you to do if you're a preacher at some Somebody said, well, God's called me to preach and I'm not going to work. Well, I doubt if he called you to preach. I'm not fussing now. I'm just telling you. Sometimes we are the preachers. A lot of times are the laziest bunch I've ever seen. They'll lay around waiting on everybody to wait on them. I'm telling you, God has given us more abilities than to just preach. Amen. God can help us. And here Paul was a tent maker. And, and Brother Tommy, he, 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 was, uh, he had this occupation other than just being an apostle and a preacher and a missionary and a, and a penman of the word of God. He was a tent maker. So sometimes the burden of survival will bring a discouraging night in your ministry. And you had to work to make ends meet. Anybody else ever had to do that? Boy, I'm glad for about four amens there. Hey, I'm just simply saying that sometimes, hey, men of God, we're not too good to get our hands dirty. Now, I may be treading on thin ice here, I don't know, but I can tell you this, I'm not a novice anymore. I've been around the block a time or two, and I'm going to tell you, God has never used anybody that wasn't willing to get their hands dirty. Hallelujah. I want to say, friend, we need to understand that there's a burden of survival sometimes that is involved in the ministry. Now, we see the burden of survival 
Look at verse number four. Verse three ends up with him being a tent maker. Verse number four, and that word is a connecting conjunction. And it ties in. He said, and reason in the synagogues or in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So what are you saying, preacher? Well, the Sabbath was their Saturday. And we find that Paul worked all week and then preached on the Lord's day or his day. Are you getting what I'm saying? He worked and preached. And I don't hear God fussing at him none. I don't hear God rebuking him any. He worked and he preached. Me and uh, some of y'all remember Brother Ray Scruggs. Brother Ray Scruggs pastored the Bethany Baptist Church over 150 years, I think. Down in Traveler's Rest, he was, he was one of my heroes, and I loved him. And he and I was putting siding on the house one day, vinyl siding. He'd call, I went over there in the meeting, and we was putting siding on the house. We went out, and I was helping him work. And there's a young preacher come up, and he said, what are y'all doing this for? And we said, well, this folk need, need this work. They need this help. They, they, they can't get it. It needs to be done. And he said this, he said, well, God didn't call me to work. And I'll never forget what Brother Scruggs turned and said with that old deep voice. He said, I, I don't guess God called you at all. <laughs> Every person that God ever used was busy doing something before he ever called them. Now I do understand there is a real difficulty and when times and the ministry gets tough, going back to that, whenever you don't have a need to, but when there is a need, don't be afraid to go back. Is that not correct? I don't know why I'm laboring this point so long. I'm just simply saying the burden of survival, uh, the taking care of his material needs, it's why the Lord, it's one of the reasons the Lord spake to him and said, Paul, it's all right. It's okay. We not only see the burden of survival, but I see secondly, blasphemy against the scripture. Verse number five, now it's bad enough to have to work all day and then preach to folk that don't want it. Verse five says, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, all, G all Paul was doing was preaching Jesus Christ. And the crowd began to blaspheme. Now let me say, you can, it's good, men of God, if you are bivocational and you go to the job on Monday morning whenever you've had a wonderful presence and time with God on Sunday. Sunday morning, the crowd was up. Offering was good. Sunday night, God moved in and you rejoiced in the Lord. It makes a good week. I want to tell you, friends, when Monday rolls around and you've preached and you've had opposition and you've had difficulties and there's been those that says, we don't believe that. It makes tent making a whole lot worse. And it's no wonder that the great apostle Paul had to have God to come to his rescue in the night and speak to him. I don't know who, I have no idea why God's ordained this, but I'm just telling you, in these hours and in these days, yeah, just because you carry a Bible and wear a suit and a tie 
doesn't mean that everybody's going to believe what you have to say. I'm just simply saying there's a God in glory. If he's given you a calling on your life, preach the word. It'll take care of itself. So we see there was blasphemy against the scripture. Then I see the breaking point of the servant. Look at this. Verse six, and when they opposed themselves, that's strange, and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From henceforth, I'm going into the Gentiles. <laughs> now this is Paul. Somebody said, well, I've never resigned on money on Monday. Paul did. <laughs> and there ain't a preacher in here that knew more of God than Paul did. They blasphemed. He's already wore out from tent making. And now the crowd rises up against him. And he says, well, I'm just, just, I'll just leave it with you. Your blood be your own, on your own head. And he shook his raiment. I mean, he's upset. He's up and he shook his raiment. And he said, well, if that's the way you're going to do, I'm a leaving here. I'm going somewhere else. Uh, uh, even Paul got discouraged. But guess what he does? Bible verse seven, and he departed from thence and entered into a certain man's, certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Now here's somebody else living in the past storm. <laughs> It was the house right next to the synagogue. Paul didn't even have access to that. There was another fellow took up residence in the prophet's quarters. Now just stay with me here. He said he went into the house which joined hard to the synagogue. Now, what he don't understand, and we'll get to this in a moment, but in verse eight, he doesn't know, Paul doesn't realize what's taking place. But in verse nine, while Paul is in there in the night, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision, be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. He said, hey, Paul, the devil has magnified your situation. All you can see is all of the problems and all the people that's causing the problems. But God said, Paul, I can see in the night what you can't see. I can see in the night what you're not able to see. I see that I've got much people in this place. Hey, man of God, don't get your eyes on the negative few, but God is looking at the positive rest. The rest of them believe you. They trust you. Don't kill your good sheep fighting the wolves. Sheep won't eat wolf food because sheep are wolf food. Now listen, there's been a lot of fellas that got their eyes on the negative view and slaughtered the whole crowd that was, a, that was for them. Listen to me, man of God. Feed the sheep. Don't fight the wolves. Feed the sheep. Feed the sheep. 
Well, preacher, why should I feed the sheep? Because wolves will starve out on sheep food. <laughs> wolves won't eat sheep food. And if you keep feeding the sheep, they'll starve out eventually. You feed the sheep, get with the shepherd and get you some sheep food and feed the sheep. The wolves will eventually starve out even though they're sitting there spitting out what you're giving. Don't let that bother you. There's a little flock in there that's eating everything that you're giving. You just feed the sheep. They'll scatter. They'll scatter. Feed the sheep. Well, preacher, I really thought they were a sheep. Well, wolves could come in in sheep's clothing. Well, how can I detect them? Feed the sheep. Wolves won't eat sheep food. <laughs> Feed the sheep. And if they came in in a sheep's cloak, they've killed a sheep somewhere else. How did they get that coat? <laughs> hey, I don't know how I got here, but I'm telling you, friend, Paul said, I'm done with this crowd, but he didn't know that in amongst all of those blasphemers, there were some believers that God saw. God saw them. God saw them. Paul could only see the problem, but God could see the people that belonged to him. <laughs> oh boy I've been abused and misused by the wolves I've actually been slapped in the vestibule of a church by a deacon and somebody said well I wouldn't have took it I know I understand but God said vengeance is mine and I'll take care of it Somebody said, well, if I was your size, that wouldn't have never happened. Size ain't got nothing to do with it. If it did, a cow would outrun a rabbit. <laughs> I'm just telling you, we don't fight our own battles. I'm just saying to you, friend, there's a God in heaven. You feed the sheep. You stay with the sheep. Yeah, I'm not talking about compromising. You can't never get along with wolves, but it, the, they survive on a fight. They love a fight. As long as there's a fight going on, you'll never get rid of them. Feed the sheep. Feed the sheep. There's a little old hungry flock. <laughs> There's a little old hungry flock that said, preacher, leave them alone. Just give me a little something to get me through till the next service. Please, preacher. When you're shooting at the wolves with a scatter gun, you're gonna hurt your sheep. Lord, help me to move away from here. But I'm just simply saying, there's a God in heaven that came to Paul and said, Paul, it's night in your life. You can't see, but I can. So he stood with him and said, Paul, preach. Don't be afraid, preach. went in that little old, can I preach my heart? I, I went in that little old church at Yonder and Crossville. I ain't nothing. But I went in there and the first Sunday I went in, we had 30. And the men gathered with me on Sunday night and they said, preacher, was there? I didn't know them. They didn't know me first time we'd ever met in the same county where I was raised. Never met them. I didn't know them. Preacher, you think you might be interested? I said, I, I doubt it. I, I just finished, I, to God be the glory, I just finished scheduling in the end of November. 
a year before last, five years in advance in evangelism. I just finished the five years. I said, I doubt it. Brother Brian, I said, I, I don't think I could be interested. And my old Sunday school teacher, he's 86 years old, put his arm upon my shoulder and he said, preacher, he said, we don't know what to do. He said, we don't figure that, that sheep have the ability to choose a shepherd. I'd never heard that and I've never gotten over it. He said, I don't figure that sheep have the ability to choose the shepherd. He said, God normally speaks to the shepherd about the flock. And that got in my heart. And by Wednesday of that week, by Wednesday of that week, God had done put the burden of evangelism out and put that little old flock in my soul. Hey, well, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to me carefully, young men. Listen to me, preachers. Listen to me, families. There's nothing greater than being in the will of God. There's nothing like the serenity and the peace. I've been called a fool and an idiot, and I second the motion to both of them. I've been called everything, but I'm telling you, I've never in all of the years of my ministry enjoyed God more than I am now. Oh, what a Savior. What a God. There's nothing, nothing greater than doing what God says do. Oh, it's so big in my soul, I can't only stand it. God is real. God is good. So I don't have no time limit. Look at this. It, it seems in Paul's situation, it seems in Paul's situation here, it seems that God had work behind the scene and Paul didn't even know it. You see, his eyesight had become so dim to spiritual things. He started seeing everything in the flesh and all he could see was the problem and he couldn't see what God was doing in the dark, in his darkness. He couldn't see what God was doing. Well, what was God doing? Well, verse eight, Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue got saved. That's pretty good. Everybody was blaspheming, but not the chief ruler. <laughs> and then we see with believed on the Lord with all of his house. <laughs> I don't know how big his house was, but if it wasn't but two in it, that's, th that's two, that's three, that's real believers. But I believe it from, from history, from the history standpoint, it said that Christmas's household could have been as many as 45, just not dealing with his blood relatives. But the household involves everybody that was working under him. They all got saved by the grace of God. And Paul didn't even know it. He's mad. He ain't going back. Christmas got saved. Christmas household got saved. The Bible said, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed. <laughs> the Corinthians got saved. But in Paul's night, he couldn't see that. But God can see in the night. And he came to that servant in the night and said, Paul, it ain't as bad as you think it is. Keep on preaching. And the, and the Bible said that this missionary stayed with them over a year longer. Paul said to Timothy, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. 
He strengthened him to keep on preaching. Go with me to Acts 23. Acts 23, verse 11. Now we'll say more about what transpired in the previous verses. The Bible said, and the night following, the Lord stood by him. <laughs> out, of, out of one night into another, but the Lord don't ever deal with nights. <laughs> oh, Lord. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. We not only see the word of God or the word from God in the discouraging nights of the ministry, but listen carefully. I see a word from God in the directing nights of the ministry. When uh, you don't know exactly what it is that you need to do, it's night, no light. You're saved, you know in your will of God right now, but there's an uneasiness and God is working and you don't know what to do. Uh, the directing nights of the ministry. He gives direction. Let me say he gives directions in the times of a divided congregation. You see, Paul now is before the Sanhedrin. He's given his testimony. Ananias, the high priest, commanded that Paul be slapped on the mouth. And he smote him on the mouth. Paul smacked in the face, slapped. And Paul said, I'm sorry. <laughs> Paul gets slapped in the mouth and says, I'm sorry. <laughs> Paul said, I didn't know it was the high priest. I said, I'm, he slapped in the mouth, smote in the mouth. And Paul says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That does away with most of us rednecks capabilities. Amen. <laughs> no wonder God used him like he did. And then, Bible says in verse six, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, you know what Paul did? He just began to deal with that divided congregation. God, and I'm not gonna take time to deal with this, I wanna to get to the last point. But God gave Paul direction in what to say and what to do when the congregation was divided. Now he never did reconcile them, but God got him out of there. Let me say to you, when the congregation is divided, and I'll just say this without elaborating on it, stick with the scripture. You try to reconcile a divided congregation, the Sadducees didn't believe the Bible, neither did the Pharisees believe the Bible, and they're divided, what are you gonna do? Now, you've got hope if one part's divided and they believe what you believe. But when both sides are divided, you're the only one believing what thus saith the word of God. You ain't got but one thing to do. Look for direction from the Lord. You say, preacher, you don't have a right to say that. I've been there. Don't tell me I don't. They're in a divided congregation. Stick with the scripture. And then when the crowd becomes dangerous, look in verse 12, Acts 23. And when it was day, certain of the Jews, now watch it, that night, that night, God stood with Paul. But when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together 
and bound themselves under a curse saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had to kill Paul. I love that. And the Bible says in verse 13, and they were more than 40 which made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse. And could I say this? When you turn on the man of God, you have bound yourself under a great curse. But now they're the ones that brought them this curse on themselves. They said to the chief priest, we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Then that crowd, one of two things, they either starve to death or they're a bunch of liars. The Bible says in verse 15, now therefore ye with the council signified to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever we come near, are ready to kill him. Yeah. Now here's a crowd that's dangerous. Yes, now they've been divided previously, but they become dangerous now. And always a divided crowd becomes dangerous. Because when you get a divided crowd together against the things of God, that's a dangerous situation. We see, Bible said in verse 16, but when Paul's sister's son, Paul's nephew, Paul's sister's son. We didn't even know Paul had a sister except for right here. Paul's sister's son heard about the conspiracy. Now here's what I put down. In a divided congregation, stick with the scripture. In a dangerous congregation, look for a sister with a son. There'll be somebody there that's going to be on your side even though you don't even realize it. And you can go ahead and study this and read down through here. And through Paul's sister's son, Paul was able to escape unharmed. Paul. So we see he gave a de desired course. He allowed Paul to, to escape. Now, what did, what did Paul say? He strengthened him to preach. That's the first night. And the second night, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. That's the second night. Go with me to Acts 27 and I'm done. Now we have another time where Paul received a vision in the night, but that was, that was in Acts 16. But I'm just dealing basically with when the Lord stood with him. That's what Paul's remembering in 2 Timothy 4. You remember Acts 27, very familiar scripture. And let me say to you, in the words, <clears throat> the words from God in the discouraging nights of the ministry, and then I'm glad for a word for God, from God in the uh, directing nights of the ministry. But I want you to look at a word from God in the destructive nights of the ministry. When it, you think everything's coming apart, you don't know which way to go. Let me say that God allowed Paul to get on this ship that was in the providential hand of God. God allowed Paul to get on this ship, Brother Stanley. Now somebody said, well, he's there <clears throat> as a prisoner. He's there as a prisoner. He gets on as a prisoner, but he ends up as the captain. He gets on in handcuffs, but he ends up as the captain of the ship. See, what you think 
may be incarcerating you may turn you into the captain. Because when the storm gets raging, they're not interested in what the captain has to say that's driving the ship. They want to know what the captain has to say that's been in touch with God. And let me say this right here. Listen to me carefully. Paul was drug into this storm. This storm was not meant for Paul. This storm came because they went against what Paul said. But yet Paul was still on the ship. And if they had listened to Paul back yonder in the beginning of the voyage, they wouldn't have encountered this storm. But Paul has been drug into the storm. There's some of you in this congregation and that's listening over the radio and on the internet all across the world. You've been dragged, that's a Tennessee term for drug, you've been dragged into a storm. If they had listened to you back yonder, they wouldn't be in this storm. But you've been dragged into this storm. You're in this storm and even though you're in the storm, you're there being dragged into it. You may have a child. You may have a situation that if they had listened to you back yonder in the beginning, they wouldn't be facing what they're facing. But because you're tied to them by love's strong cord, you're dragged into their storm. You wish you wasn't in the storm, but you're there by the providential hand of God. Why? Because God has got a way of getting them to listen now. They wasn't here before, but you've got their ear now. <laughs> you've got their ear now. And God's allowed you to be in their storm to give them a word because you're the only hope they got in the storm. Amen. You're the only channel to heaven that, that's in the storm. And you're in this storm because you've got connection to heaven. And now you can give a word to them in the storm. They wouldn't listen before, but they'll listen now. So if you're dragged into a storm and the storm's not uh, uh, of your making, but you're in it, don't just give them a piece of your mind. Don't tell them, well, I told you so. Just get along with God. Get a word from God. And then God can do the rest. But I want you to look at this and I'm done. We see the destructive nights of the ministry. He, you need to realize in the ministry that you need to consider the possibility of damage. Verse 10, Paul said, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. Not only of the lading in the ship, but also of our lives. Paul said, men, if we go this route, there's going to be damage. There's going to be damage. You need to consider the possibility of damage. Need to consider the promise of direction. In the night, we find in verse number 23, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Just continue even though you're in the storm, continue in the promise of direction. Keep going the way God said go. And then let me say this. Let me say, listen carefully. Conform, conform to the providence of delay. You may not get where you're going as quick as you think. There are delays in the ministry. 
Because the Bible said that Paul told them, I must be, we're going to be cast up on a certain island and we don't know how many days we're going to be there. But Paul has already been given the promise that he's going to Rome by God. Sometimes there's delays in the ministry, men. Sometimes you feel like you're only going in circles. Has your, has your ministry ever gotten to the place that you feel like it's just the same old thing over and over? Did you know that sometimes going in circles is the will of God? Well, it never could be, preacher. It never could be the will of God to go in circles. Well, talk to Joshua. Ask Joshua if it's the will of God to go in circles. Joshua, is it ever the will of God to go in circles? We wouldn't be where we are if we hadn't went in circles. <laughs> Same old thing day after day. But you know what they're doing? They're obeying God. <laughs> what y'all doing? Going in circles. Well, what's the purpose of it? Tearing this wall down. <laughs> well, we never seen it tore down like that. You ain't never been in obedience to a God like we've got. Yeah, we're going in circles. But we're going to get where we're going. And sometimes you get where you're going by going in circles. Stay with God. There'll be delays in your ministry. Goodness, I ain't preached this long since last night. Goodness. But when they was coming through our part of the country with Interstate 40, those hills and mountains, I remember my dad-in-law asked one of the engineers, my, dad, my dad-in-law was a truck driver. My dad-in-law asked him, said, uh, ever, been a, ever been a highway made that you couldn't get over? He said, no. He said, every highway is engineered that it doesn't matter how heavy the load is. It does not depend the, the, the getting over the, the hill don't depend how big an engine you got or how heavy the load is. It's that the designer of the highway fixed it. That even though you slow way down and others in their little sports cars are zooming by, you just keep on going. And God, and God has never designed a highway. See, we think we got big motors and light loads, but it's the designer of the highway that gets us over. It ain't how big we are. It's who's designed the way. And we trust him. You may pass us by now, zooming by, but just hang around. We'll top over. And the heavier the weight, the swifter we can go down the other side. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I've tried to be obedient and I pray that you would use these simple analogies and truths to give truth to the hearts of your people. I love you. Lord, I just want to tell you publicly again, Thank you for what you're doing in these days. Thank you for Anchor Baptist Church and the work here. Thank you for the revived desire. <laughs> in Jesus' name.